Hello once again and welcome to our program this evening. We are very pleased to welcome Annalise Scar, who will be telling us a bit about a book called Nansen's Passport. And um, this is part of a series that we have every third Tuesday leading up to the Camden Conference. And to tell you a little bit more about the Camden Conference, I would like to introduce Jane Nice. And on behalf of the Cabinet Conference, welcome. We'd like to extend our thanks to our host, um, uh, Camden Public Library, for making this program possible. And to tell you about the Camden Conference, we are, uh, first and foremost, a nonprofit, nonpartisan citizens forum, forum, driven almost exclusively by us volunteers from our community. The mission is to foster informed discourse on global issues. And in keeping with that, we offer these free community events leading up to our annual weekend conference. These are intended to provide background on the yearly topic and to touch on areas related to the February conference that may not be covered in our two-day format, two days for this year. Anyway, the speaker's views, opinions, and positions expressed are theirs alone and do not necessarily reflect those of the Camden Conference, the nonpartisan part there, folks. This year's conference, our 34th, is the Geopolitics of the Arctic, a region in peril, which will take place virtually on February 20th and 21st, 2021. It'll be live streamed, so it will be not a Zoom, but a live streamed event from the Camden Conference. Please visit our website at camdenconference.org. You can see the speaker lineup and further information on membership and conference registration, and certainly check on the format, which is different this year, for our conference. Our speaker this evening is Annalise Scar, who is a creative director at the Farnsworth Art Museum. Annalise is Norwegian American artist with a deep interest, as you'll see, in Arctic landscapes and themes. She's earned a BA in graphic design, followed by residencies in Norway um, at 78 degrees north, which I gather is the end of Norway, <laughs> further north, and another residency aboard an MSKIP container ship from Portland to Reykjavik in Iceland. She's lived in Greenland for her work at the site of the largest Arctic, uh, the largest active glacier in the Northern Hemisphere. Following these Northern turns, she's, uh, she had a residency here at the Maine Media Workshop, and we are delighted she is now settling in as the creative director right here in Farnsworth Art Museum, and we hope she stays for a long time. I'm, she has been very proud to work with Two Ponds Press um, for her book that you will you will hear about tonight. Um, the owners there, um, Leif Rockefeller and Ken Schur, are uh, worked worked with her and supported her in this, and she is very very proud to have worked with them. So please go down to see this book because it's just amazing. I've, I've seen this presentation before and I'm still glowing with the incredible creative um, piece that she, is, she has made and with many, many helping hands. But it's at Page Gallery right here in Camden. So if you get a chance, go in. And if you don't see it, please ask them because they will bring it out for you to look at. So thank you very much. And I hope you enjoy listening to Annalie Scar. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you to the Camden Conference and the Camden Library. I've enjoyed so many of the uh, presentations and events this year uh, that have been uh, put on by the Camden Library as well. And, and um, I want to say before I even start here, if you have your passport handy close by, you might want to grab it. I'm going to reference uh, the U.S. passport during this talk. And if you don't have it, it's fine. I have plenty of photos. Um, but if you have it, it might be fun to, to grab it if it's close by. Um, 
I, uh, first of all, I just want to say something about the fine press, uh, fine press book format. It's not your typical um, mass produced book. It's an, it's an art piece. It's a, an edition of 60 copies of this particular book. Um, everything is handmade. Um, I will talk more about that later in this presentation. Um, but let me uh, begin with my slides here. Um, let's see here. Is everyone seeing this? Yes, it looks good. Okay. So Fritjof Nansen uh, was born in 1861 and he was a Norwegian polar explorer. Um, and he was very much respected for his extraordinary, uh, extensive and influential work pushing boundaries in a region of the world, which at his time were really fairly unknown and, and borderless. And he was also a scientist. He was a um, biologist, a writer, an artist. And he and a team of men were the first to traverse the interior of Greenland in 1888. Uh, and he would later very famously uh, mount the Fram expedition. The Fram was his ship. Um, and it was an expedition from 1893 to 1896, and it was an attempt to be the first to reach the North Pole. And he was not able to reach it. Um, that was, you know, famously reached by Perry later. Um, but he was able to get to the furthest north that anyone had been up uh, to until then, which was about 86 degrees north. And he wrote a two volume book about it called Farthest North. And it was this book, that was translated to several languages um, that at the time uh, uh, sort of he became a very highly respected celebrity, really far beyond the borders of Norway. Um, so um, let's see here, there we go. So Nansen would become even more well-known in his role as a statesman. Uh, and a humanitarian, roles which came to him specifically because of this fame and this great respect that he won through his Arctic explora uh, exploration, uh, and which would in turn lead to the creation of a very famous passport that would bear his name, and it was the Nansen Passport. So I wanna take you back a bit because a uh, hundred years ago this year, it was that the League of Nations was established in Geneva. Um, and with it was the first global multilateral intergovernmental organization that the world had seen. And as it happens, Fritjof Nansen, zoologist, scientist, artist, adventurer, he was on the Norwegian delegation to this brand new organization, which was founded by American President Woodrow Wilson after the Paris Peace Conference. In, um, and in 1921, this League of Nations would appoint Nansen as the High Commissioner for Refugees. And it was a role that he would personally win the Nobel Peace Prize for in 1922, um, but that he would also be awarded posthumously um, through the work of the Nansen International Office for Refugees in 1938. And sadly, as we know, the League of Nations failed its mission of promoting and enforcing world peace, which, you know, it gave way to the start of World War II. And, and sadder still is the fact that the United States never became a member of the League of Nations, despite Wilson being the founder. And that fact is cited as one of the reasons the League was not powerful enough or influential enough to do the work that it was meant to do. So after World War II, of course, a new organization, the United Nations, would emerge in its place under the leadership um, of the first Secretary General, uh, also a Norwegian, Trygve Lee. So this, our Nansen's passport uh, was just recently in September presented to the library at the United Nations in Geneva uh, by the Norwegian um, ambassador. And uh, to have the book reside there at the very location of the League of Nations, the publishers and myself feel very honored that it's made such a full circle back to its origins. 
Um, I have a little disclaimer before I begin the, sort of the, the meat of the presentation here, and that is that I am not a nonsense scholar. I am not an expert on world affairs or political history. I'm not a scientist, but I am an artist. And as an artist, I am inspired by all those things. And the core of inspiration for this particular project is this question, how did Nansen's love and experience of the far reaches of the borderless North affect him as a visionary humanitarian whose Nansen passport would go on to save or improve the lives of 450,000 displaced or stateless refugees? And how can we today look back and be inspired by his work and his words in a time when climate refugees are projected to number 150 million by 2050. So my project is called Nansen's Passport. And everyone seems to think this is a typo. It is not a typo. It's a work that references the words and history of the past as they might apply to us today and ultimately how we might approach our future. So before I um, talk about uh, the Fine Press book, um, I wanna talk about uh, the international passport in general, because this is very interesting to me, um, because although the international passport is so important today, so ubiquitous in discussions of belonging, of human rights and of identity, it is hard to believe that until 100 years ago, it was actually the uh, centennial on October 21st of this year, there was no universally standardized passport. And until then, there had simply been sort of a loose standard of random paperwork with varying information, varying shapes and sizes, with no really unified look to it. Um, so why then, why in 1920 did this suddenly become an issue, especially in Europe? Well, for one, until then, there had been no multilateral global body like the League of Nations who can enforce standards like this. Um, these are some American passports and uh, different designs over the years that were before 1920. Um, and also one of the reasons that uh, a standardization of the passport became necessary was that besides the general global travel by passenger liner, Europe was finally completely connected by railroad. Um, and a more casual mode of mass transportation had become a reality where before it was, it was not something available really to the masses in the same way. And the freedom of movement be between countries became necessary as workforce was needed to rebuild Europe after World War I. Also another point, photography was also finally cheap enough to be accessible uh, to people, still expensive, but um, it, it allowed for photographic representation in a passport. Um, so now you have this standardized passport. What happens to those who are displaced, like people of post-revolution Russia at the time, where your citizenship may have been revoked, or if you're fleeing genocide in the Ottoman Empire, or if you were completely stateless, like citizens of Austria-Hungary, uh, who literally their country no longer existed. So what Nansen did is he recognized that one of the main problems refugees faced was this lack of internationally recognized identification papers, which in turn complicated their request for asylum. He introduced the first legal instrument used for the international protection of refugees. And this was the refugee passport, which would eventually bear his name, the Nansen passport. This is an actual Nansen passport. Um, the passport was financed primarily through the purchase of stamps. You see some of the stamps on this. Um, you'll see some references to this further on in the talk. Um, and the stamps were used to validate and also renew the passport. Um, and it also fed into a fund that would finance the continuation of the program. So it was a really very creative 
self-supporting solution for a very complex humanitarian issue. So last year, uh, in 2019, which feels like eight years ago, <laughs> I had the privilege of uh, getting an informal tour of Nansen's home, which was outside of Oslo. I'm Norwegian. My parents live in Norway. I was, you know, visiting them, but had the opportunity to come out and, um, and see Nansen's house uh, called Kulhegda. It's right outside of Oslo. It's called, that is translated into the Polar Heights. And it's now the uh, home for the Nansen Institute, which is an organization which is an independent foundation engaged in research on international environmental energy and resource management, politics and law. And while I was there, I had a very nice guide, uh, Hilda, who led me to a climate controlled room in the basement. And I got to see one of these passports firsthand and it was made out to Mark Chagall. Um, other, uh, other influential Nansen passport holders were Anna Pavlova, Vladimir Nabukov, and uh, Robert Kappa, and uh, Igor Stravinsky. Um, and it is here uh, that I want to bring you to the present day. Um, and it's hard to comprehend that in the 1890s, when um, Nansen took his fabled ship from, which means fourth, or forward, um, this vast frozen Arctic region of the world was really just this unknown area. Um, and today it is the most rapidly changing and prized region of the world for military advantage, for profitable shipping routes, for oil extraction, um, because it's an area that used to be covered in ice, it's, it's um, you know, becoming more and more exposed. Um, for Arctic tourism, cruise ships, uh, and for the mining of uh, other resources like rare minerals, like they're doing in, in Greenland as the ice uh, sheet uh, disappears. And while many still discuss whether or not climate change is happening or man-made or even real, there are plenty of entities working to commodify this region of the world due to the rapidly melting cover of ice. And this here is a map from the 1920s featuring the way the world was seen at the time. And it has, uh, you know, the roots of explorers past. And, um, and here's a map of that same area today. As military advantage, commercial shipping routes, Arctic tourism, mining, they all didn't, these commodities didn't really exist um, a century ago and they have been made available due to the sea ice melt and thermal expansion of seawater caused by global warming and climate change. So, you know, what would Nansen think only 100 years ago? 100 years ago, that's just a couple of generations. His, his grandchildren are still alive. And, and um, if he knew that the melting of the Arctic due to climate disruption, um, the the thermal expansion, the very seawater that he crossed with his ship and the resulting sea level rise would play a role in one of the greatest projected human migrations in history. And it's estimated that 500 million to 600 million people, which is nearly 10% of the world's population, are at risk from displacement by climate change right now. And around 26 million have already had to move a figure which could grow, as I mentioned earlier, to 150 million by 2050. So I'm sure you've seen some of these magazine covers and, you know, it's talking about Arctic meltdown, about um, sinking planets and, and, and migration uh, due to, to climate change. And it seems very far away. You know, you see these and it seems like it's somewhere else. And, um, and then all of a sudden we see sort of magazine covers, uh, publication covers that are much closer to home. You know, here's something from North Carolina, um, North Carolina, you know, Florida, New England, and, you know, National Geographic, Statue of Liberty. And then, you know, all of a sudden it's right in your face. You're, you know, reading the New York Times. And, um, 
all of a sudden these climate issues don't just happen to people in faraway places. And how can our understanding of past policies to relieve refugee issues help us think creatively in solving future climate uh, refugee issues? So these are the Cook Islands. Um, yes, I'm showing this image because the Cook Islands are in fact one of the nations to be uh, affected by sea level rise to the point of dis displacing its 18,000 citizens, but also because of this. It's their 20 cent coin, which features the image of an Arctic tern, which is the animal which migrates the farthest of any animal on Earth, almost 50,000 miles, with no regard to man-made lines in the Earth. And of course, it brings me to 2020, the year of the publication of this project. And there are few years where the need for multilateralism has been so clear and the importance of global solutions to address issues which affect everyone, no matter where their borders lie. Which brings me to this project, to Nansen's Passport. And, it, and as I mentioned before, the Fine Press book is, um, is something that is all completely handmade. There's uh, a team of wonderful production artists um, who have um, helped produce this book and um, spearheading it is Amy Berezzo of a Shelter Bookworks, who has actually been the one uh, to actually bind these books and bind the artwork together. Um, it's a whole team. So while the concept and the design and the artwork may be mine, there is literally a team of craftspeople, about five people involved in producing these 60 books. Um, so uh, I would highly recommend checking out Amy Brezzo's work. She's a wonderful artist in her own right as well and does her own books also. Um, I also just want to quickly reiterate uh, what was mentioned earlier about Two Ponds Press. They're a local Camden uh, press. It's Leave, um, Leave Rockefeller and Ken Shore. And um, they do all these beautiful handmade books. And just an interesting aside is that Leev Rockefeller's, her, um, her mother was married, uh, you know, her first husband um, was Tuit Heyerdahl of Kantiki fame, if you're familiar with uh, Tor Heyerdahl and the Kantiki expeditions. So the interest in Norwegian explorers was a natural fit for them. And, uh, Again, it's a delight that they did this. So the book project started as a proposal last year in May of 2019 and was begun mostly from copious notes that I took, a lot of research uh, and drawings about how this book would look and what it would contain. And one of the drawings uh, ended up being the Arctic Turn, which would follow as a graphic theme within the book itself. Um, the, the case here is on the right. It's fairly big, it's like 13 by 19 inches, and uh, it's almost formed like an atlas to contain the passport that's within it, um, and sort of symbolizing uh, the world, uh, you know, the individual contained by the world. Um, so uh, here is the passport you see on the right side there. It's under a translucent vellum. Um, but it's in this very elaborate case. And you see there's a mission statement, artist uh, statement that's sort of lying on top of that. And you see the, the map on the inside cover on the left side. And uh, you also uh, see this, um, uh, you see this orange folio as well. Uh, I just wanna point out here, if you see this strange shape uh, that you see that sort of sharp oval ship shape um, on top of the passport is actually the shape of the hull of um, Nansen's ship Fram, which is on the left there. This, this here actually use that um, as a shape within the design. Um, and uh, the case has a copper plate printed Arctic map on the inside cover. It's mounted right into the, the case. And um, this map is inspired by the marine maps of the 1500s uh, with its sort of illustrated monsters and myths. And those old maps were much more about what was known about the world than used as a navigational aid. Um, 
And the inspiration for that map is the Carta Marina, which was created by a Swedish bishop in 1539, Ulaus Magnus. And it was the first Nordic map giving place names. And you, you see all these illustrations of the sea monsters. I'm sure you've seen some variation on this type of map because, you know, map makers after Magnus would continue this uh, tradition of these sea monsters and, and all of these, uh, you know, stories within the map. And again, it was about what they thought they knew about the world. It was a cultural map. It was not meant for navigation necessarily. Um, so on the Arctic map that I created for Nelson's Passport, all of the continents you see on that right uh, hand map, they're all, it's like a uh, North Pole view. Uh, all the continents are in the Arctic around the symbolic star of the North Pole. And it represents the impact that the Arctic has on the whole world. Uh, you see all the continents are in weird, um, you know, positions. It's, it's not uh, the way that it actually looks on the map. Um, and in the details of the illustrations, you'll see not sea monsters, but you'll see small details and images of military, political, and commercial interests which represent the human impact currently being felt in this part of the world. And um, so in the same way as the map from 1539 was what one might hear about these places that we might not ever see ourselves, so is this Carta Borealis. So as I showed you earlier, this is uh, this um, inside the case here is this orange folio that you see at the left there. And this bright orange folio, and it's really, in this photo, you can't really tell how incredibly bright orange this thing is, and it would be worth going and taking a look at it uh, at Page Gallery. It's bound in life jacket material, actual life jacket material, um, which I found to be a very powerful color and symbolism uh, to represent, uh, to represent um, refugees. Um, the folio, that orange folio, it contains an extra loose copy of the map, um, but also it features a copy of the Nobel Peace Prize. I think I mentioned earlier that Nansen uh, won a Nobel Peace Prize in uh, 1922 and also posthumously in 1938, and it is cast in metal from old ship parts. And, but, but it's an exact copy of, um, of the Nobel Peace Prize, but you see uh, that it is melted, which is a discrete sort of reminder of the power and impact on, um, uh, uh, impact of nature, sort of despite even the best, uh, very best of human civilization and culture. So here is the US passport, uh, very familiar. If you have your passport, you can pull it out now and look at it. Um, it is a very uh, uh, familiar looking uh, piece. All passports in the world have these exact measurements. Uh, this is a more recent, in the 1980s, they created a new standard uh, of size. Um, uh, and uh, it is exactly, I believe, 88 millimeters by 125 millimeters. And the actual and the design of the um, the the book that I did is modeled on the modern U.S. passport itself, uh, a symbol of power and freedom, but also steeped in so much controversy and conflict in regards to what rights it affords, who is entitled to one, and who is not. And it's really one of the most recognizable passports in the world. So my passport, this is the actual book that's within this huge case that I've just talked about. And this is the book itself, which is, of course, modeled after the US passport. Um, I wanted it to reflect the Arctic Ocean somehow. So this book is bound in dyed uh, North Atlantic salmon skin from Iceland. And uh, on the cover, it features the Arctic tern instead of the eagle. And under it, instead of the words United States, are the words United Status, um, to remind us that climate change does not respect borders and that we are all in this together. This is um, a photo from uh, the Icelandic Fish Leather Company that I was um, 
uh, working with um, there on the left there, the tannery. Um, and it's also worth noting that the very format of the international passport from its beginnings exactly 100 years ago is a book on its way to extinction in a, in a lot of ways. Its functions are being replaced by biometrics. And so in essence, you may in the next years become your own passport. You know, you'll just get scanned when you, uh, when you, when you go to the airport. So the passport itself is disappearing as well. So, um, this is the design of the interior of the actual United States passport. If you have your passport, you can open it. You'll see on every visa page, there's a different spread with a different quote, a uh, famous quote by famous people. This is Lyndon B. Johnson here. Um, and it's uh, these landscapes in the background. And um, you could look through your passport and see some of these. And in the passport that I designed, I created new landscapes and I did it by creating collages that are made entirely from United States banknotes. Uh, $1 bills, $2 bills, five, 10, 20, 50, $100 bills. Uh, and this book is printed entirely using the cyanotype process, which is a uh, alternative photo process, which uses sunlight, water, and paper uh, that's that is prepared with, a, with special photochemicals. And um, here you can just see as a reference, you can see some actual uh, banknotes and see the wealth of information and the detail and illustration that's in that, which I have taken from to create these new, um, new image. And I just wanna mention also, because people always ask whether it's legal to use money in this way. Uh, and uh, people have been very concerned about me getting arrested, I guess. And as long as you are not altering currency uh, for the sake of payment, uh, some sort of value, it is perfectly legal to do so, just so you know. Um, and when I say collages, as sometimes people have a hard time understanding what I mean by that. And this is a very good example of the illustration, I think, because you can see these waves, in the upper illustration there, um, are the hair of Benjamin Franklin. He has great hair for ocean waves. Um, and even the eyes on the whales there are his eyes. So that's what I mean by taking pieces from money and creating new landscapes. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the using banknotes for the collages not only symbolizes the financial interests in the in the causes of climate change and also the commodities associated with climate change, but also in the economic impact of climate migration and refugee issues, which is substantial. So remember I talked about the, the stamps in the original Nansen passport, and I have stamps in my passport as well. And the stamps on these pages are cut from actual money of countries that are predicted to be the hardest hit by climate related migration in the coming years. And of course, a nod to these stamps. Um, here's a picture of some money that I cut up. I cut a lot of money um, uh, for these 60 books. So here's the first page of uh, Nansen's passport, and it's the identity page, and it actually shows Nansen himself, and the image of him is split in two, uh, just like uh, the slide I showed earlier. Um, the image on the left is uh, of him as his, in his past as a young polar explorer in this vast borderless region of the north, and, and on the right is him as an older statesman and humanitarian helping refugees cross to find man-made borders. So at the top of each of these visa pages throughout this passport of mine uh, are the words of Nansen himself. And they're taken verbatim from his Nobel lecture in 1922. And by using Nansen's words from almost a century ago, my goal was to avoid the partisanship of quoting today's politicians or quoting partisan rhetoric. These words, nonsense words, promoting empathy, reaching across an ocean of time by someone 
who was really beloved and respected. These excerpts from his speech, they create a narrative throughout this book, which feels really contemporary and relevant. And, um, and they're actually grounded in historical events. And as I end my presentation here, I'm gonna walk you through the 10 visa pages in this book with my collages and stamps and with Nansen's own words as the narrative, because this is an imaginary passport for everyone, because one day we may all become climate refugees. And this is the first page here. The world can no longer rely on panaceas, paper, and words. These must be replaced by action, by persevering and laborious effort, which must begin at the bottom in order to build up the world again. The golden produce of the earth has been trampled under iron feet, and the land lies in ruins everywhere, and the foundations of its communities are crumbling. This is the outcome of the lust for power, the imperialism, the militarism that have run amok across the earth. The history of mankind rises and falls like the waves, and we have fallen into wave troughs before. This time, as far as I can see, the trough is even deeper and more extensive, and in addition, exists under conditions that are now more complex. Understanding is certainly not attainable in a day, but the first condition for its final establishment is the sincere will to understand. This is a great step in the right direction. We may reasonably hope that the process of revival will be more rapid this time for everything happens more quickly in our day because of our systems of communication and the vast apparatus of economic facilities that we now possess. What is the basic feeling of people? There's no doubt that for a great many, it is one of despair or distrust of everything and everyone supported by hate and envy. No future, however, can be built on despair, distrust, hatred, and envy. The first prerequisite surely is understanding, first of all, an understanding of the cause and the nature of the disease itself, an understanding of the trends that mark our times and, what of, and of what is happening among the mass of the population. The continuous mutual abuse of groups holding differing views, which we witness in the newspapers, will certainly never lead to progress. Abuse convinces no one, it only degrades and brutalizes the abuser. It is because of blind fanaticism for and against, especially against, that conflicts come to a head and lead to heartrending struggles and destruction, whereas discussion, understanding and tolerance might have turned this energy into valuable progress. Everyone must join in this work. We must take up the fiery cross and light the beacons so that they shine from every mountain. We must raise our banner in every country and forge the links of brotherhood around the world. The governments too must stand shoulder to shoulder, not in a battle line, but in a sincere effort to achieve the new era. And I will leave you with a quote by Nansen, which is not from his Nobel lecture as the previous quotes were, but from another speech in 1926, which I feel speaks to how the love and respect of our environment and of adventure itself really, not only makes our life more noble, but may make us act more noble as well. So why create artwork around political or humanitarian topics? Art forms have, in fact, always communicated things and inspired people to think. Artists can challenge cultural narratives and inspire emotions and in a way that traditional political methods rarely do. And guilt does not inspire initiative. People will not act necessarily on facts, it's emotional and physical experience that inspires us. And thank you for listening to this and, and, and uh, being interested in this project. Like I mentioned, uh, Page Gallery would be happy to show you the book if you're interested in seeing it uh, yourself. So thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Anneli. Um, at this time, I would love to invite folks to please, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the chat box right now, and we'll make sure to get them to Anneli. Uh, we did have one at the very beginning of the program, um, and it was from Linda, and it was when you were first introducing passports, and she asked, why did the U.S. decline membership in the League of Nations? That is a very good question. Uh, I think it was it was the same reason that they were so uh, slow to get involved in uh, World War II. Um, that it was uh, that, that they were very. I think Wilson very much wanted to be a part of it, but it just was not. It was not flying at home. So I wish I had more information and more details in that answer. If but anyone, to, if anyone else in the audience wants to go ahead and chime in the chat box, if they have any, you know, more depth to that answer, feel yeah. free, definitely. Uh, Susanna says, wow, Annalie, what a treat. Can you reiterate again where we can find the book? Well, the book, you can always go and, uh, um, you know, the book is available with Two Ponds Press. Uh, you can contact them at twoponspress.com. But Page Gallery in Camden, which is right on Bayview Street, right at the beginning of Bayview Street, it's a wonderful art gallery. They have a copy, uh, that's the prototype copy that is there. If you want to come and see it and handle it, it's very not precious. You don't have to wear any little gloves or anything. You can just check it out. They are happy to show it to anyone who comes by. That's, uh, I. I look very much forward to doing that. It's it's very exciting that we can actually get the chance to look through what we've just seen this this impression of. Um, Nancy asks, in doing this project, what did you learn that was unexpected, and how has the project influenced your future art? That is a very good question. I would say, first of all, the second part of that question. Um, I would say that I've become much more, this is my first, I did a, uh, I have done a book with Main Media Workshops uh, and Fine uh, Press, a Fine Press book. And this has made me very, very interested in continuing um, to do these types of projects. It, it allows me to create artwork. It allows me to use design. It, you know, I'm a history geek, so I like to do that type of, uh, research as well. So it's, it's definitely inspired me to do more projects like this. And as far as what surprised me, um, I think, you know, this speech from his 1922 um, Nobel Peace Prize acceptance, you know, this, uh, uh, the speech they had, how incredibly relevant it still feels. I mean, as you know, I pulled quotes from it and created a, a narrative from those quotes. But each one of those quotes, I mean, I, it, it, it was something I discovered sort of later in the project um, and uh, the speech and um, it really blew me away at how similar things are, how very different things are now, but also how very similar these sort of human um, conflicts and crises and the ways we try to solve them are very similar you know, whether it's 100 years ago or today. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you put it so perfectly when you said earlier that it just feels so contemporary. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Um, we did have someone expand a little bit upon uh, what we were talking about earlier. It said isolationism is the reason the US does not typically get involved. Yeah. Um, let me move on. Okay, so Jane asks, what was it clear when he got back how Nansen's worldviews affected by being on his three-year expedition? Whether that was, uh, can you say that question again? Sure, uh, Jane asks, was it clear when he got back how Nansen's worldview was affected by being on his three-year expedition? Did he have journals or anything that, that stated his- He uh, has, I was lucky enough to uh, be able to go to the National Library in Oslo when I was uh, in Norway last year and be able to look in all of these journals that he had um, written in for those three years. And um, I wouldn't say necessarily that, um, you know, I. it's really sort of this idea that you know, it was this borderless North exploration that inspired him to deal with issues of borders. That is sort of my 
take in a way on this project. It's not something that there's any necessarily any background that he was directly impacted uh, by his exploration. But I like to think that it did affect him. You know, I think that, um, uh, you know, this, this, uh, this love of this area and this interest in this area, I think uh, probably, um, uh, you know, created a, in him sort of an appreciation um, that maybe he didn't have uh, before he did that work. So, um, and, 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 you know, and, and in a lot of ways, the fact that he did that work was what allowed him to become a humanitarian. You know, um, he wouldn't be so well known. He wouldn't have been pulled into all of this work that he ended up doing after he did this uh, expedition because he was so incredibly revered and popular and he ended up um, you know, uh, helping, um, you know, Norway sort of gain its independence from this union with Sweden in 1905. He became the first um, uh, ambassador to Great Britain for Norway. Um, and, you know, all of these things led up to this incredible role that he had that really affected so many people. Um, this question harkens back to your art background and says, what is your visual background? I am, uh, a, you know, my, my, uh, my degree from the National College of Arts in Norway uh, is for design and illustration. And so that's my background. And, um, but I have a, a, you know, I'm a visual artist. I paint. And a lot of the work that I've done in Arctic areas has been related to painting. Um, so when I've, you know, traveled to Greenland or, or to Svalbard or the work that I was doing on board this container ship was all, you know, pretty traditional, you know, painting uh, techniques. So doing this type of work is a little bit different for me, but I really enjoy it. Is this the most comprehensive book arts project that you've done? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, it's so many layers, as you can see. There's a lot of, there's nothing really um, accidental with this book. Everything has sort of been thought out. Everything has a meaning, layer of meaning. And, and uh, so it, we haven't really left anything to chance there. Well, that was really special for me watching your presentation, just kind of uh, taking in how thoughtful you were with every single aspect and detail of this. And um, as n I'm not an artist myself, so it's fascinating for me to get a glimpse at how artists see the world. And I think in a similar way that, you know, our previous presenters in this Camden Conference um, Community Events Program, we we've had a lot of artists. We've had um, you know, we had John Paul Caponegro, he's a photographer, and we had Peter Rawson, a photographer, and they were showing us these images of, of the Arctic that, Ooh, as you were images. saying, they, yeah. just, they evoke emotion and they help yeah. make, as we were discussing before, they help make the, the situation, the statistics, the data, the information so much more tangible and, um, and pressing. It just, you know, you, it, it hits home, you know, especially here living in Maine. Yeah, um, it, it creates that connection. I, I actually, when I went to Greenland in 2017, I brought my son, mm -hmm. who was 11 at the time, specifically because I wanted him to have a connection with this place. It's just this, you know, you talk about the Arctic or the high Arctic, I should say. And it's one of those places that most people haven't been or will not go to. I mean, it's really sort of out of your way. And, um, and to have a, a real connection to those places that allow you to to fight for those places or be involved in, in work and preserving and taking care of um, places like that. So, you know, I don't know if my son remembers much from that trip, but I hope he uh, has his own connection with that. Hmm. This is a question from Brandette says, where will your 60 books end up? Will it be private collectors, museums, government archives? Who did it in, uh, who did you envision would be the owners of your beautiful art as you created this project? Well, uh, Two Ponds Press, they, um, they approach a lot of libraries and special collections in libraries that is a little different than, um, you know, the usual books that you will just pull off the shelves, you know, to read um, that are more sort of fine, uh, 
perhaps rare special collections libraries. And the books have been found a lot of homes in, uh, there's obviously there are some private collectors who have bought these books. It's a very niche sort of art collecting, you know, like this art collecting niche, these fine press books. Um, but some of the places that this book has ended up is the Boston Athenaeum, um, Bowdoin, uh, Columbia University has one, La Jolla Athenaeum, um, Scripps College, Stanford, um, UC Santa Barbara, the, the, the Library of Congress Special Collections has one. Um, of course, the library at the, um, at the United Nations in Geneva. And uh, just recently, we sold several copies to the Fromm Museum in Oslo in Norway, who have their own collection of authentic Nansen passports, and they have his ship as well. So that's really, really special to me, and um, that it ended up there. But uh, several other, you know, Del University of Delaware, University of Miami. So I love the fact that these go into these libraries, and that's exactly, I mean, I love that people collect this type of artwork, but the fact that, you know, they end up in um, libraries where people can access them mm -hmm. and that they're an educational tool means a lot to me. And I know that, that because of the topic they, they are used, I've had some feedback from Bowdoin, from students who have been um, you know, using the book as a you know, research project um, and um, gotten some feedback on that. Um, uh, I know of students currently who are working with a book. And I mean, that means a lot to me to be able to do that work and have it sort of affect other people as well. Um, and as a matter of fact, I, I wanted to ask you earlier, uh, as I was seeing the Carta Borealis, are you going to be making any individual pieces? Like you said that there was a, a, a single uh, separate piece of the Carta Borealis that was included in the book. Would anything like that be available separate from purchasing yes. the full I, book? Yeah, I have, um, I have a, a, a dark blue edition of those maps mm. uh, that I did an edition of 10 of those. Uh, so certainly if anyone's interested, you can reach out to me and uh, also some prints on my website of some of the illustrations. So, you know, I don't want to uh, want to, you know, uh, tell people to go to my website. I, I do have inside, you know, that's, Feel free to shamelessly plug. Yeah, I, I, I feel like I'm already shamelessly plugging. No, it's fine. But anyway, yes, there are um, things uh, that are available like that. And um because it's, it's fun to have pieces of that, you know? Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and Jane mentions, I love hearing about the details of your sources um, for your page by page composition, Ben Franklin's hair and eyes. Does your book include any background on some of those details? It, it doesn't. It's, um, you know, that's where, you know, the production and the process of making this book, that's why, why it's, you know, fun to do these talks because it is so incredibly layered and it can reference all these things. And, you know, people might become interested in some of the references as well. Like, you know, I learned an incredible amount doing research for this project, like the Carta Marina by Magnus from, you know, uh, the, the 1500s, which is just a beautiful, beautiful map. I like mm. know all this stuff about this map now. And I have a little bit of a antique map fetish as a result <laughs> of it. Um, uh, but yeah, so. <laughs> no, it's fantastic. Uh, the, the Osher, um, that's the, the map museum down in Portland, right? Is, I, did you? That's the, yeah, that's more uh, contemporary, contemporary maps. maps. I didn't know if, uh, if their collection extended into the, the um, ancient maps, the older yeah, maps. Yeah, they might, for all I know. I mean, um, they might very well have something like that. So uh, go dig yeah. around there after the pandemic's over. I'm sure someone will let you in. <laughs> well, it's also wonderful to know about the fact that libraries do have special collections that you can, you know, seek out artist books and things like that at, mm. at libraries. And um, it's a whole level of, you know, uh, very elaborate, uh, very special books that you can have access to. Well, speaking of very special, this was a very special presentation and what you have created is so incredible and so unique. And I just thank you so much for coming this evening and telling us all about it and introducing it to us. 
Um, and for all of you who joined us this evening, thank you. Again, these are talks that we are holding. These are Camden Conference community events, and these are all leading up to the Camden Conference on the same Arctic topic, Arctic topic um, in February. So please visit the Camden Conference's website to find out more about that, what's coming up with them, and please visit librarycamden.org to find out more programs that we have coming up. Once again, we have recorded this program, so if you would like to share it, please find it on our Camden Public Library Program's YouTube channel by tomorrow, and you can share that link with your friends and family. Um, Anneli, thank you. This was wonderful. I thank wish you, you so much for having me. I wish you a beautiful holiday season and also to everyone here tonight. Good night. Good night.